you're likely looking for new ways to compost if you're watching this video. And there are so many different ways to compost, but one of which works great for the climate that I'm in, which is a zone three where things get very cold in the winter, is actually worm composting. So I'm gonna show you how I manage a my worm compost bin. It's a single bin, no holes, no drainage, incredibly easy. I just add to it throughout the winter and I harvest from it in the spring. I'm gonna warn you, this may not be like the classic way to set up a worm bin, but it's incredibly inexpensive and it works. So that's all I truly care about. Not to mention it's easy to manage and I don't have to think about it too, too much. To start off this worm bin, all you're gonna wanna do is have some peat or coconut coir and then make sure it's moist. Now, moist to the point where when you go to squeeze it, water isn't dripping out. Out, but it's damp. It's on the verge of allowing drips of water to come out. That's how moist you want this to be. Again, no holes in the bottom of the container, nothing of that nature. From there, you can do shredded newspaper or shredded cardboard. I personally don't do that. I just do the peat and then I start throwing my food scraps on top. One thing I will say for putting coconut coir peat into your bins to start them is you could use old potting soil if you wanted to. So if you don't wanna go buy peat, you could use the old potting soil. Just make sure there's no granular fertilizer in there. That's like my only thing. Um, or you haven't used liquid fertilizer in a while, but you've continually watered that soil to kind of flush out any fertilizer that's in there. And you could just use old potting soil. Um, and that's what I'm using just to do my second half of the bin for today. So now, I don't do the shredded newspaper or the shredded cardboard because I'm using a lot of electric compost byproduct, which is not compost. It's just heated and ground food. So it's dry and therefore it has a high affinity for water and it actually helps to manage the moisture levels within my bin. So that's the logic behind not adding that. If you're finding that the addition of food biomass along with that pre-moistened soil is causing too much water build up and worms are starting to climb up the sides or they really seem like they're lingering on the surface, then you may wanna consider adding that newspaper or cardboard as you see fit. So if you're adding lots of things like tomatoes or uh, high moisture items to that compost, then you may find this to be the case. The water that I use, by the way, is not treated. It's not distilled. I don't put a uh, dechlorinator in it. It's just, it's from the tap <laughs> and my worms are just fine. I have a, a ton of worms too, and I don't see, I haven't seen any negative uh, influences from that. So that is something that I, I'm gonna just check off as may affect worms, but not to the point of damaging your worm compost bin. And then from there, I just put the cardboard on top to help maintain that moisture. If the moisture gets too high, remove that cardboard. And this is not shredded cardboard. This is just cardboard that you place on the, the surface. Now my bin, I do go for an opaque color. So something that light cannot get through because worms do not enjoy light. And when I go to harvest my worm castings, again, you want to make sure that this is done in the dark. One thing I will say when harvesting from a bin or worm bin in general is that it tends to clump. So you can buy or make all these different sieves, but you're going to be completely exhausted by actually removing or separating the worms from the castings. One of the best ways to do this is actually to move all your spent worm castings to one area and then put your new compost on the other side. So essentially you're splitting the bin in half. Now, this means when you go to harvest, you're going to obviously harvest from the worm casting side. You're going to have some worms in that worm casting side, but not much. Most of them are gonna be hungry and they're gonna to wanna to go to the side that is just newly established. So I never restart my bin from zero, if you will. I'm always adding to it and just splitting it in half. Now, in times when it really starts to build up and I start to get a ton of um, worm castings, you can remove 25% of just the worm castings in general, worms and all, and your colony will reestablish. And if you're looking for higher breeding rates or um, higher levels of worms, if you will, or if you want them to multiply quickly, putting them in a cool space. So I put mine on the basement floor, right on the cement, and then also 
um, not feeding them. So if you restrict them from food for a little while, they tend to go really crazy when they do eventually get food in multiplying. So that is one way to get your uh, levels back up quickly after you remove a lot just because you're running out of space. Or you could technically start like a whole new pail of worm castings if that's something that you're into. Now, if you're using these worms in ground, like in your garden outdoors, and you're not using them for indoor gardening or container gardening, or if you intend to put the container byproduct in the compost at some point, I would look into where you are in the world to determine if earthworms are invasive and if they are native to your soil. Canada and the US, parts of the US, you may want to look into this. There is quite a few ecology programs out there actually trying to eliminate worms, even red wigglers, the good guys, because they're not native to the ecosystems in Canada, in particular the boreal forest. And because of that and their vivaciousness to actually take out a plant product, they can decimate ecosystems by eating the seeds and the leaf litter layers, things that those ecosystems rely on. So definitely look into that if you're just going to use worm castings outdoors. If you're intending to sift your worms out, um, trust me, you'll never get them all, plus there's eggs and stuff. So even if your intent is not to put them in there, they will slip in. That's just the nature of worm castings and how they work. So do keep that in mind. I have a whole video on that topic. Um, the University of Toronto has some programs in place, um, some research that's being done on how to eliminate these invasive species from those areas, why earthworms are not native to North America or portions of North America actually has to do with the glacier and the weight of the glaciers. So I'll just link that video if you want to learn more about that. But ultimately, I do find worm castings to be an incredibly powerful tool for both houseplants and outdoor plants. In particular, they have the byproduct of what plants uh, identify as like frass, insect waste. And so plants will actually trigger an autoimmune response. It's almost like a vaccine, if you will, for plants. And because the byproduct is around the roots, it signals to the plant that there's potential insects in the area and that they need to up their protections against said insects. So it's great for just preemptively protecting against pest problems in your plants, as well as it is a really good fertilizer. It's really nicely balanced and it provides a lot of moisture to your uh, pots. And it also just increases micro, um, di like microbe diversity, which is always important. That's why I always say, if you use cow manure one year, use sheep the next. If you use, you know, worm castings one year, use vegetable compost the next. You always want to switch it up because the more uh, byproduct you put into your soil, whether it's containers or houseplants or your garden, the more biodiversity, the more microbe colonization you have in your soil. And that is one thing that we find in urban environments in particular is we're getting kind of really specific colonies of microbes surviving and thriving and others just completely disappearing. So always re-inoculating your soils, what we would call that with something new is key and worm castings actually provide that. So it's great. And also composting in Canada when it's cold. I mean, worms are great for that too. So I hope this helped you guys out. It's really not that complicated. I don't do anything fancy and I've had these guys for three, four years now. I've never had to restart the bin and yeah, it's worked wonderfully. They go in ebbs and flows. Like I'll have a ton of them and then I won't have many of them. It's partially my fault because I forget about them over the summer. Um, but they've never like died off entirely despite the fact that my bin does not have holes and I just have like a cardboard top on top. And yeah, I find it really simple to, to manage and they're effective at eating. My husband doesn't even know they exist actually because they just, they don't even stink. They can't even smell them. So something to keep in mind there. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, be sure to give this video a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button and I will talk to you next time. Bye.